Welcome to the Invest for More Real Estate Podcast. My name is Mark Ferguson, and I am your host. I'm a house flipper. I flip 10 to 15 houses a year. I own 13 rental properties with a goal to buy 100 by 2023. I'm also a real estate agent. I've been licensed since 01. I run a team of nine. We sell close to 200 houses a year. So on this show, we like to interview house flippers, landlords, and the best real estate agents in the business. So stay tuned for some great shows. If you want more information on my rentals, on the numbers, how I buy properties, check out investformore.com. Hey everyone, it's Mark Ferguson with Invest for More. Welcome to another episode of the Invest for More Real Estate Podcast. Today I have Brett Rickenbach on, who has been fix and flipping full time for about two years. Um, he's another one of my guests who's been, you know, an avid reader, listener of the podcast, or reader of the podcast, as he says. Really happy to have him on the show. He's been working with his brother really trying to improve his business, take it to another level. So I want to t hear about his story, how he got started. I know he's in the corporate world for a while and then transitioned to real estate. So I know many people will be interested to hear how that happened. Brett, thank you so much for being on the show. How are you doing? Good. Glad to be here. Yeah. No, thank you. So from the very beginning, I know you, you told me a little bit about how you got started, but you were in the corporate world before you got into real estate. So I know you thought you wanted to be into real estate, but we're kind of stuck. Tell us a little bit about how you, you got involved in real estate and, and transferred from the corporate world to flipping. Sure. I went to college. I got a four-year degree in biology. I worked in biotech for 16 years, the same company. They had some changes. I got laid off. They gave me a full-year severance and unemployment and health insurance for a year. And I said, okay, this is my chance now. I always been wanting to do real estate, get involved in fix and flips. I happened to be my brother was a contractor doing kitchens and bathrooms on his own for about five years. We said, hey, perfect timing. Let's start doing it. We had some money saved up and it took us a while to buy the first house, but we finally did it. And we've been doing it ever since for about two years now. We're on house number seven, working on seven and eight right now. That is awesome. And you guys, you've been doing great for starting two years ago. Did you do any investing or anything on the side while you were working at your, your biotech job? No, I, I did not do any major investing. I bought my second house about eight years ago, which is a two-family, and I rented out one half of that for the last eight years. But I had always read all the old uh, Carlton Sheets, your books, your website, and I always wanted to do investing and get more rentals, do fix and flips. But I just never had the, I don't know, the guts to get out there and do it until I got laid off. So it actually was a blessing in disguise and kind of kicked me in the butt and made me do it. So, But as for previous experience, no, just the two-family house, that's all. Okay. Yeah. No, that um makes sense. And it's really tough with a corporate job. I know a lot of people who I've worked with and talked with who, you know, they really want to invest, really want to buy rentals, really want to flip houses, but it takes a lot of time to <laughs> to really buy right and, and flip houses especially. And it's tough with a full-time job, especially if you don't have a very flexible schedule. But it can be a blessing, like you said, you know, it doesn't seem like it at the time getting laid off or fired or, you know, losing your job in some way. But a lot of times it lets you do what you really want to do. And it works out in the end. So that's awesome. <laughs> you know, in a way. <laughs> I, I agree. Very cool. So how did you find and buy your first flip? We went to a realtor that we knew it was recommended to us. And we just told him our story, like I just told you. And I said, Hey, let's find us a house. And he, we looked at probably three or four. We found the first one we found that we liked to put an offer on. It was pretty low from what they were asking and we ended up getting it. And we were both all kind of shocked. And he, he said, you know, sometimes the banks, they get a new manager comes in or the, or the end of the month and it, it just, things change and they just take the first offer that comes in after the change. And he goes, I think that's what happened with you guys. Cause this house should have sold for a lot more. And we got lucky on that. And that was probably, uh, we did okay on that one. We made about $38,000 total on that one after everything. Nice. Well, if you don't mind me asking, what were they asking for and what price did they accept? Let's see. I think it was around, it was a, it was a foreclosure. It was vacant. It was around 135 and we got it for 110 and we ended up selling it for 199 We first put it oh. on for two, 219 We got a little too ambitious. There was a problem with the, the floor had sloped a little bit in the kitchen because of some settling and people got turned off by that. So we ended up dropping the price and we ended up selling it at 199 
Nice. That's not a bad profit for your first flip. No, no we're happy <laughs> with that. Now we do have to. Sp- I have to split it with my brother fifty fifty. So it's it's not as big as it sounds if I was doing it on my own. But I couldn't do it alone without him. Right. No, that's great. And uh, how did you finance that flip? Did you guys save up money, or did you, did you get a loan? That one, we I had a lot of money from my severance package, and we had money saved up, and he had some money. So we combined that, and that's how we were able to, to buy that. It was all our own money, no loans. Okay. Very cool. And how long do you think it took you to complete that flip from start to finish? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, that's the big thing. It always takes longer than you think. <laughs> I say from the time we bought it to selling it was about six months. As you say in your book, that's kind of what it takes. We sold it December 29th, so it was on the market in early November, kind of a bad time with the holidays coming up. And yeah, probably about working on it was probably three and a half, three and a half months maybe of actually physically working on it every day. Okay. All right. Nope. That's, you know, that's, it sounds like a long time, but it's really not when it's your first flip, you're doing a lot of the work yourself. That really isn't too bad. And as long as you plan for it in the beginning you'll usually be okay. But a lot of people just kind of, they don't realize how long it's going to take. And they say, oh, it'll take three months. I'll be in and out. And then when it takes twice as long and the costs are twice as much, it it can be a surprise. So, (laughs) You know what? The big things are easy. It's all the little stuff at the end that you're just kind of the punch list stuff and this and that and going to Home Depot to buy one thing and one thing and one thing. Like that just kind of gets to be a, a drag at the end. So we're trying to limit that as much as we can and plan ahead and get everything ahead of time. So it's, we're getting better as we go. No, that's true. And even when I'm hiring contractors and they're doing all the work, the same thing happens with them where we've got to go through punch list, all the stuff that wasn't done quite right, get all the little stuff stuff done because just about every time there's something that they don't get right, they don't finish all the way and we've got to go back and make sure it's done. Very cool. So how did you, you bought that one, made a decent profit. Obviously you guys kept going. How did you buy your next properties? Was it the same way with an agent or did you find other ways to buy properties? Uh, let's see. So we have bought, I think, three of them. We bought on online auctions. We, we won the auction, and we. But then at the, after we won the auction, we still use our agent to facilitate buying it, so he gets a cut. So we have three of those, and the other three were just off the MLS. And one of them, our biggest score was a friend of mine who was flipping houses, and he knows I was flipping houses. He said, "Hey, I, I I'm too busy. I got four houses going on now." I got this deal. I've been working on it for a year. The guy's finally ready to sell. I can't do it. Do you want it? I said, sure. I'll go, I'll go talk to him. I, it was just like you read in the books. You sit down in the kitchen with the old guy in the house and hadn't been updated in 50 years. And there was paint was peeling off the walls. And the refrigerator was 35 years old. And we did a deal on paper and, and it worked out great. And that was, that was our best profit to date, about $80,000. So. Oh, wow. Nice. That's, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> so to answer your question, yeah, we have been using a realtor pretty much, yeah, for everyone except for that deal. And when I sold that house, we, we used the realtor. Just buying it was on my own. Okay. No, that makes sense. Very cool. And right now, I think you mentioned a little bit earlier, but you and your brother are pretty much doing all the manual labor on these, right? Yes. We're there on site every day. It's sort of our full-time job. My brother used to do kitchens and bathrooms for people, but you know, now he doesn't. He turns all that work down. I don't go anywhere else. I just go to the house's you know, we we have our electricians, plasterers, plumbers, guys who are used to the big stuff like that 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 you need a, a license, and we don't want to we don't mess with that stuff. So, but we're there every day. We do we do most of the painting. I would say we we hired out the outside painting on a couple houses, but we do all the inside painting. All the we put in hardwood floor. We do the cabinets, bathrooms. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of like it. It's better than being. I used to work in the in the biotech lab and corporate world, like you said, and this is kind of it's kind of a nice change. So I I don't mind it. Hopefully, we can transition and start hiring more things out. I'm curious, when you're doing this, are you guys paying yourselves for that work or is that just, is it kind of free labor yeah. and then you split the profit? We sort of, we have one bank account where we have all our money goes into that we buy the houses, do the repairs with. And over, every so often we'll just write a check to ourselves for $20,000, put it in our personal bank account and just live off that. So then we keep track of it on a spreadsheet. So we don't pay ourselves by the hour, by the job. It's sort of just a running tally. Okay. Okay, so that makes sense. So when you're making 80000 on a flip, you're kind of getting free labor in that number? Right, right. Okay. That includes our free labor, yes. Okay, just trying to make sure I get a, a clear picture. That's no problem with that, just trying to figure out. Very cool. And then, so you've got two you're working on now, and then you said you just got another one under contract. 
when you're working on multiple properties at the same time, are you kind of doing one first and then moving on to the next one? Or are you doing both at the same time? How are you handling the work on multiple well, properties? Yeah, that's a good question. We usually, we have a trailer with tools in it and we unload all our stuff and we stay at that one house pretty much till it's 90% done. Then on the other house, if we have one or two going, the other one's going, we try to hire, we have a carpenter that we use that he's available sometimes, sometimes he's not. So he'll get over there for a week or two, get things going, do some framing, and maybe we can hire some demo guys to go do some stuff ahead of time. And then we try to try to time it so we can get in there after they're done. But it doesn't always work. Sometimes it sits there unchanged for a while. So that's kind of a downside. We, we do lose some time and money there. Okay. Nope, that makes sense. So you've done six in two years about. What are your goals? Do you have a goal for how many you want to do per year? Or are you just kind of slowly improving? What's your thought about the future? Good question, too. We'd like to do a minimum of four a year. I think we could live on and be okay. I'd, of course, we'd like to do more. So I'm thinking if we could do somewhere between six and eight a year and have a good carpenter or good contracting crew that we can hire to do a house while we're doing a house at the same time simultaneously, that would be ideal. Basically, so we can do, say we can do three on our own, maybe four on our own. Maybe we could do eight with a crew. So that's kind of the goal to have and make more money and do less work ourselves. And then also I'm getting my real estate license in uh, New Hampshire, which is the state we do most of our work in. So I'd like to transition into doing some more home sales, maybe getting some, you know, selling houses on the side to, with friends and also doing our houses that we're flipping. So I'm kind of looking at that avenue. Long term, we'd also like to do some rentals, it, almost exactly what you talk about in your in all your blogs and books. Have the rentals as one part, have the flips as one part, be a realtor as one part. So diversify. That's that's our long-term goal. Okay. That makes sense. What do you think your biggest roadblock is right now? Is it doing all the work yourselves? Is it finding deals? What's keeping you from doing more flips? I'd say it's probably finding the deals is number one, getting a good margin on the deals. Like I said, we do all the work and we're only making, say, 35 to Forty thousand dollars on a house. If we start hiring a crew to do that, you know, I don't know how that's going to be fifteen, twenty thousand dollars worth of labor. Who knows? So then, that's the part I'm, I'm kind of struggling with. The other part I would say is is finding the good contractors to do the work. We can get the skilled people that do the plumbing, electric, drywall. That's easy. It's that day to day person that's there just doing the trim work and putting up walls and cabinets. That's the hard part to find. Okay. Yeah. I know that things I struggle with as well. So I understand that part of it. All right. And have, have you gotten your financing worked out or are you still just kind of pooling all your money together? How are you uh, financing the properties? No, we've, we've definitely branched out with financing too. We're doing pretty well where we have that pool of money where we can fund one house ourselves at all times. And my mother has been generous. I should say my parents have been generous and they loaned us about $200,000, which we just keep out the whole year at she charged us 5% now. So that's that's a great deal. And then our realtor who we work with, he loans us money house to house when he has it up to $200,000 or so. I think he's charging us 8% now. No points, but he gets the sale on both ends. So he's happy with that. And so that's been working great. So that's about as much work as we can handle doing it ourselves. We can have three houses going at once. So yeah, we have those finances to pay for them. And then we use our own money usually to for the repair costs. Okay. Is your realtor going to keep lending you money when you get your license and stop using him? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he, he will. What we'll probably end up doing is the ones that he funds, he'll get the full commission. And then ones that we find on our own that we pay with our own money, then and we, we're going to do a split 70% to me, 30% to him. Okay. <laughs> just, just making sure. <laughs> Very cool. Have you ever talked to any local banks or anyone about getting a, a bank loan on these flips? I have not. No, because I didn't have a full-time job. I don't have two years of tax returns, which they always want for self-employed people. So I haven't gone the, the route of a bank. Okay. It might be something you try, just probably not a big bank like Chase or U.S. Bank or anything, but like a local bank, a community bank. You know, I've got multiple banks here who will finance my flips. And the really nice thing about them is I do have to do down payment. I've got to put 25% down, but they charge me 4 to 5% interest and one point on those loans. And they do it because they see I'm an experienced flipper. They've seen the work I've done before. 
And it's, it's not like a regular mortgage where they're looking at your history, your debt to income ratio, all that stuff. They're more looking at the business and if you know how to flip and can do it. And with your experience, I would guess that you might be able to find some banks that might finance some properties as well. Okay, that's good advice. See, I was reading about that in your book with the portfolio lenders is what you're looking for, correct? Right. Yep, exactly. So I would, I would look into that because, I mean, if you can do, you know, a couple loans and you might be able to buy one more property at a time, mm-hmm. you know, which might make a big difference in the business. Okay. We'll do that. Cool. So if your biggest problem is finding deals, I'm curious, are you relying on your realtor to find you deals? Are you guys looking? How are you guys finding deals right now? We find the deals. We find the houses and then we have him show it to us. He hasn't brought us anything. He said, hey, I got this great deal. It's not on the market yet. Why don't you guys come take a look at it? Oh, no, I take that back. That has has happened. The last house he has brought to us. Sorry, Mo, if he's listening to this. (laughs) So yeah, I don't want him running around showing us 25 houses and we don't buy any and make all these offers, nothing happens. So we only have him show it to us if we're definitely interested and we're going to make an offer. But we get the uh, daily updates from his from him emailed to us. We'll look through those and we'll say, hey, this one looks good. Can we go see it today? Because I know we got to get there quick if it's a good deal. And we, you know, we, we've gotten a few that way and yeah, it's been okay. Okay. And you said you have bought a few through auction. Was that like yes. home search or auction.com, one of those sites? One was Hubzoo and okay, Auction.com yeah. might have been two, two of them. Okay. Yep. I was going to suggest Hubzoo too. That's that's usually a good one. Okay. And have you ever researched or looked for wholesalers in your area? No, we haven't looked for them, but we did go to an auction. Someone else won the house and we got a call from a realtor we know and said, hey, I know who won the house. If you guys want it, you know, $5,000 finder fee. And we actually ended up buying it that way. But we haven't sought out wholesalers you know, just constantly to, to see what they have. Um, is that something you would suggest? Is that a, a good route to go? I would. The tricky part is about nine out of 10 wholesalers probably won't ever give you a deal. But if you can find one or two good wholesalers, they might send you 10 deals in a year or more. So I would definitely at least keep your eyes open, look around, do a quick search for wholesalers in your area. And one way I found a couple wholesalers is they sent me letters on my properties because I have rental properties. They sent me letters to see if I want to sell them. And so I just reached out to them and said, hey, I don't want to sell my properties, but I do want to buy some if you have any available. So I don't know if you've ever gotten mailings or postcards or anything like that, but I, don't just throw them away. I always keep those and, and contact them to see if they have any deals. Another wholesaler I met because they, were, they sent notifications to all the agents in the area they said they have wholesale properties. They'll pay a commission to agents on some of these deals. And that's how I found them. So I would definitely keep your eyes open. Maybe even ask your agent if he's ever gotten emails from wholesalers or anything. I bought one this year from a wholesaler that I bought for 124 And we have it under contract for 210 right now. And it needed a, we spent about 25000 on the rehab. So that was a good one. And then um, I actually just got an email today on another property in my area that they had come up. So I'm going to go check out that one probably Monday. They don't have access to it yet. So I would definitely look into wholesalers too. Okay. Yeah, this is stuff I've read about in books over the years and haven't pursued that yet, but I think that's a good idea. Yep. Cool. Yeah. And, And there's always the direct marketing aspect too, but that takes a lot of work, a lot of setup and a lot of time to get that started. So, you know, that's always something to keep in your back of your mind, but I don't know if you have to go do everything at once right now. Sounds like you guys are doing pretty well with what you're doing. Yeah, the direct marketing, I've read mixed reviews on that, and I I do see the signs in my area on the telephone poles, and so I know they're out there doing it. So it must work for somebody. Yeah, no, I've seen so many signs pop up in my area lately. It's crazy. I've never seen so many, so I don't know if there's been a big push lately for (laughs) direct marketing or what, but... Yeah, it's pretty big in my area too. But I don't do much of it myself right now, but I have done it in the past and it has worked, but it takes a lot of time to get it set up right. All right, so talk about the flipping. What are your goals for rentals? You said you've got the house you live in now and you rent out the other unit. Are you looking to buy more and more rentals? How many rentals do you want to get? I don't have a number in mind. Uh, our immediate goal is to buy a single family house that I can move into with my wife and my six month old baby and then keep this one and rent both units out and start there. So from there, I'd, I would say I'd love to have between five and 10 rentals. That would, that would be a pretty good number to start with or end with. Yes. <laughs> Do you have pretty good rent to value ratios in your area? Can you make money with rentals there? Yes, you can. I live in north, a little bit north of Boston and in, in Massachusetts. And yeah, it's, it's a very tight market. Rents are going up, but 
prices on rentals are going up too. So a decent two-family house in my town is over $400,000. So it's tough. We might move to New Hampshire, so things are a little bit different up there, a little bit cheaper. So we'll see. I just got to we got to figure out where our home base is going to be first and then look around where we're going to live. I don't want to have, you know, 50 mile away have uh, rentals and have to travel to to get to them. Right. Now you said you so most of your flips are in New Hampshire now, right? Yeah, that's one of the, you know, one of our difficulties is our our location. I work with my brother. My brother is in New Hampshire, I'm in Massachusetts. Most of the houses we found are in southern New Hampshire where they're just they're cheaper and we grew up there. We just kind of know that area better and it just kind of happened that's where our realtor was and I just feel like I'm gravitating more towards that area. I don't need to be where I am close to Boston, where all the corporate jobs are that I used to be in. So I'm trying to say is some of the things we struggle with are the different rules for each state. So you, the realtors can't work in, in both states that we use. So you have to have two realtors, two electricians. In Massachusetts, you need to have contractor's license to do work on a house that's, that you're not living in. So that's an extra expense. We have to hire a contractor if we want to do any major work. So I'd like to migrate up to New Hampshire and just keep it all in one state. That's the eventual long-term plan too. Okay. Yeah. So are you actually driving 50 miles to some of these houses every day? Yeah, sometimes I do. Probably five out of seven of them that we're doing, I have to drive 45 minutes to an hour sometimes, which I don't mind. It's not it's not the worst thing in the world. Everyone around me commutes, whether you commute into Boston and you sit in traffic, or you drive drive north instead and you go against the traffic. So, uh, But we have done two houses that are closer to me in Massachusetts, and those were pretty successful. But like I said, I'm just kind of gravitating towards New Hampshire. I'd like to move my family up there and just work up there exclusively. Okay. And your license would be in New Hampshire, yeah, right? Yeah, I want to take my realtor's exam shortly, and it would be in New Hampshire. Okay. That sounds like your base Yeah, would probably be well served in that area <laughs> with your license there and all your properties there. Okay. And you mentioned that you want to sell houses too, not just use your license for investing. Do you have a plan for that on how you're going to start selling? How are you going to drum up some business that way? Yeah, I would start out with just advertising myself to friends and acquaintances and put it out there on Facebook and everywhere and say, hey, I'm a realtor now. I'm going to start selling houses. Hopefully just get a couple a year. You know, I'm not looking to make my living off that right now and just see how it goes. Now, if you start, you know, selling houses, you're, you know, helping the flip business with listing houses, selling them, you're obviously going to have less time. You're working on the houses yourself. And I know you guys want to get to a point where maybe you're not doing as much work. Does your brother want to keep working on them as a contractor or does he want to have less time working on them too? He would like to hire out more stuff. He does like the work, physical work day to day. But if we could be working on, say, four houses at once instead of one house at once, and we're hiring out three other crews to do the other ones, and he could supervise and work on one at the same time, I think he'd be pretty happy with something like that. Okay. Yeah, because it makes sense. It seems like maybe one of your roadblocks right now is just time. And if you're doing the physical labor on the houses, that takes up so much time to get them done. And yeah, I mean, even though if you could find a crew, they'll they'll cost a little more in labor, but it might free you up time-wise to make more money as an agent find more deals, spend more money on the business instead of actually working on the houses would be my thoughts. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, and time is an issue. And it's been worse since we had our first baby six months ago. So now it's really, I got to get home. At, I can't just stay till nine o'clock at night and start and finish paying the house. It's like, no, my wife wants me home. So that's a constraint there too. So, But we're trying to figure it out. I'm just following stuff I read online that, that you post, that other people post, and uh, we're just figuring out as we go. And you said you've got, you know, plumbers, electricians, the specialty trades. You have subs for most of those? Yes. That's the easy part. I, I love working with the electricians and the plumbers because they just do that only and they're an expert in their field. And it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's finding the, the general contractor, uh, carpenters and stuff. That's the hard part. Right. Okay. Have you tried out any or, or been looking harder for those guys lately to, to lighten your load? Yes, we have. So we just picked up, uh, well, we haven't actually closed on it. We, we were closing on a house in a few weeks. And we've had a few contractors there to give us some bids and estimates on the job. So this one house, we're trying to hire out as much as we can and do a little experiment and see how that goes. If we can find a, a great guy that works out, then we're going to keep him on. We did have a great carpenter, and then his mother died, and he had to move back to Vermont. So we were really bummed about that. So, oh well, you, sometimes they, they come in and, and they go. So we got to find another one. 
Yep. Nope. In my business, it's a constant turnover. It seems like with contractors, some do well for a couple of years and then not so well. Some don't do well at all from the very beginning. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it'd be nice to have one that worked forever and did an awesome job. But that never seems to happen. So I I yeah, know what I'm, you're talking about. <laughs> but I, when I read your stuff, when you're saying that you have the same problems we have, it makes me feel okay. We're not alone. This isn't an isolated problem. Even professionals are having a hard time getting people to do the work too. So it's good to see. Yeah. Well, I would consider you guys professionals too, if you're doing, you know, that many flips. So oh, you've you. done a great job. All right. So you've got your license going. You've got the flipping business going well. I think time obviously is something where if you could hire out more work, even if it costs you a little bit more money, in the long run, you're going to make more money using your time for other activities like selling houses, finding deals. Because I imagine if you get your license you're going to be able to find more deals if you've got MLS access, if you're looking yourself and you have time to really focus on finding deals. Yes, that's one of my main purposes for getting my license is to get that MLS access, to have that instant update, you know, and every hour, whatever it is, that I can go on and check. And um, I think that's going to help us a lot. I, and I can write the offers. I don't have to call my realtor and say, hey, can you put this offer in? And, you know, he might be away for a couple hours and, you know, who knows, he could lose it in, in that time. Right. No, exactly. And on the houses you've bought recently, have they been foreclosures or yep. estate sales, just regular listings? What what have they mostly been? I think every one has been foreclosure. Two of them were occupied and the rest were all un- unoccupied and in pretty bad condition. So we actually did do keys for cash on, on two of the occupied ones and that actually worked out pretty well better than I thought. I mean, okay. sorry, cash for keys. Yep. Yep. Nope. That was nice. And and yeah, for those who don't know, just if you've got a tenant in a property, a lot of banks will do that with foreclosures is just basically you pay the previous owner or the tenant, whoever's living there to move out. So maybe you pay him a thousand, two thousand dollars and say, Hey, move out in 15 days, 30 days, and you can have your money and I get my house. So. <laughs> yeah, it worked out well. When the first guy was trying to get more and more out of us, we settled on about $2,200. And then the next woman that we had this, the same thing with, we, we told her we'd give her money to move out. And she was so happy. We gave her $1,000 and she was almost crying. She's like, I, I didn't expect this. This is so great. So we made her happy and she made us a good deal too. So everybody was happy. Oh, that's great. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie 99 Homes, but it's about foreclosure crisis and an REO agent, which you know, I'm an REO agent myself. And uh, it made us out to look really bad and evil. But I would say that when we did cash for keys, almost everybody was happy and they weren't expecting the bank to actually pay them, you know, to move out and leave. Now, I think some people have gotten more savvy as time's gone on and learned to milk the system a little more. But yeah, it's not always a bad thing when you're helping people move out and and take possession of the house. So all right cool i'm trying to think do you think there's any other major roadblocks or anything else holding you back right now that would that i could help with or that you know have yeah. need help with any ideas or anything going on i would say it's more of a maybe like my motivation or my internal drive sometimes i think uh, is lacking i get a little complacent Eight, 16 years in in my corporate world in the same company i didn't really have to expend myself too much now it's it's all on me and I realize I got to get out there and make things happen. It's not just going to roll in every week. Paycheck's not going to come in every week. So it's not, I don't know if you can help me with that, but yeah, maybe setting goals, making lists, saying, okay, in one year, I'm going to have this many rent flips done. and three years, I'm going to have this many rentals. And here's how I'm going to do it. I think I need help maybe setting up plans and actions to, to get those plans accomplished. Yeah, no, the first thing I was going to say before you said it was ask if you had any goals set, any specific whether it's buying rentals or how many flips you want to do, or even, you know, a monetary figure, like I want to make mm-hmm. this much money that year. Those really help. And I think it helps too, if you have a fun goal, like something, even if it seems completely self-serving, and not useful at all. Like, I mean, when I had my goal to buy the Lamborghini, I mean, it sounded kind of crazy to a lot of people, but it motivated me like none other when I had that goal. So I thought about it all the time and thought how awesome it would be. And, you know, it doesn't have to be that, but, you know, a vac- an awesome vacation, you know, like you said, you want to buy a new house for your family. Maybe it's buying an awesome house for you guys, something like that. I think if you have a really fun goal for yourself and then kind of build a plan around it of how to get there without sacrificing your financial situation or making bad choices, that can be really motivating and helpful. Okay. Yeah, I do like that idea. I think our, one of our, our main goals is to 
get a nice single family house that everyone will like and my wife will be happy in with a big kitchen and a big dining room and everybody everybody can come over and that's what she wants. So if she's happy, then I'll be happy. Yeah. And so, I mean, one thing you might do too is just go look at houses, even if you know you can't afford them right now, or maybe, you know, just go see them anyway and see what kind of houses are out there and just being in them and being around them and seeing what you want just helps put it in your mind and it will help motivate you too once you're like, wow, this is really nice. I can't wait to get to that point where I can afford this. Then that'll help you get out there and do things and really motivate yourself. Yeah. And one other thing that I think it's maybe a struggle or holding me back is not thinking big enough. Sometimes I'm just thinking, okay, if we just do four houses this year and you know, we made $85,000 profit, like that's good enough. I know I need to think like, Hey, why don't we try to do eight houses? Why don't we make $160,000 profit? Like I need to think a little bit bigger. Like you said, have that fun goal, have that, buy that Lamborghini, buy that big boat or something. And uh, yeah, try just to expand my wants and goals and aspirations a little more. Yeah. And one thing I think, like how, how many houses did you flip last year? In the calendar year, it's hard because we, the first year we sold two, the next year we sold three and we sold one or two this year. So yeah, they're all kind of like scattered about. So I would say, I think we sold three last year. Is my okay. Opinion. So, so you know, you can do four and you've yep. already sold two this year. So obviously, you know, you can do four. So I would always make your goals a little higher than what you know you can do at least, if not. So like, if you know you can do four, you need to have your goal at least six or maybe even eight. If you think you can do six and you think you can comfortably do six, it doesn't hurt to make your goal seven or eight to push yourself. If you don't reach it, it's not the end of the world. You'll probably still be farther ahead of where you were if you had a goal of four and you can just adjust your goals and adjust what you're doing. But yeah, I would always make your goals just a little bit bigger, a little bit more out there than what you think you can do. And that helps push you a little farther. Good advice. All right. So now you've got a list of things to work on. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm putting a little stars next to them. I wrote them all down. Yes. <laughs> Very cool. Well, no, I think you're in a great path. I mean, doing that many flips that soon without having done any before is pretty impressive. Most people do not do that many. A lot of people lose money the first flip they do too. So that's great that you made money on that one that you made 80,000 on the other one. That's an awesome spread. So I think you're doing well. I think like we talked about, some of the biggest things would be goal setting, you know, getting that motivation and then structuring it so you've got more time to work on the business and not working in it because your biggest value is going to be finding deals, really making the business grow bigger by doing more flips, not by saving some money by doing the work yourself, I think. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's where we want to be headed. You're right. Awesome. Well, I would ask you about what your future goals are some more, but it sounds like you're going to need to work on that one first. But yeah, I would I would get some definite numbers on how many rentals you want, how many flips you want to do each year, personal stuff like how much money you want to make, all that. If you want to buy a boat, like you said, I would write all that down, kind of get a plan in place and just, you know, once you write that plan too, you've got to look at it every day if you can, you know, every morning or every evening and just make sure you're on track and doing the things that'll they'll help you reach those goals. Okay, we can do that. For sure. It's hard to do. It's hard for me to do it still. But if you can get in that habit of doing it, then it really makes a difference. You've said it to me. I've probably heard it 20 times and read it 20 times. It's definitely a, a common theme, so it must work. <laughs> it seems to. When it, Because I'll notice too when I get off track and I stop paying attention to my goals or I you know, take some time off from really kind of doing my routines about looking at my business and I start struggling with stuff too. And then I realize like, well, I'm not thinking about it. I'm not working on it. So it's natural that I'm not going to do as well with it if I'm not paying attention to that those things. So the more I pay attention to them, the better I do. Cool. Well, we're getting close here on time. Are there any questions for me? Anything else you want to talk about? You know, one thing I don't really see discussed much is how do you keep track of your expenses and accounting for the end of the year with taxes and all that? We hired an accountant this past two years to do our taxes. Right now we're using a spreadsheet and we're it's getting to be too many houses, too many uh, expenses, and we are going into QuickBooks. I just bought the software and and we're going to start using that. So I just was was curious and how, how do you keep track of the expenses? That's my my big question. One of my biggest pet peeves of things I hate to do is accounting and expenses. So I have actually it's my cousin enters everything into QuickBooks and manages all of that for me. 
And then kind of my team manager, Justin, oversees that a little bit, sends me reports, make sure. And I'll review those reports every month to see what things look like, if there's any oddities, things that don't make sense. But I have someone else enter all of that stuff because it drives me crazy. Doing taxes, when I used to do, you know, keep track of, I wouldn't do the taxes myself. I'd always send it to an accountant, but preparing my taxes, it would drive me crazy. It would stress me out for, you know, however long I had to do it. So one of the best things I ever did was when I found someone else to do that for me. So I have someone else enter all the expenses, keep track of all that. She works with my accountant to make sure she has it entered right. And then I'll just review the reports basically every month. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I was thinking my wife wants to help out, so I can make her the manager and she can enter all that stuff for me. That might be a good idea. Yeah, as long as it doesn't drive her crazy. <laughs> some <laughs> some people love doing that kind of work and others just hate it. So if she if she likes doing that kind of stuff, that'd be perfect. You know, me and my brother and I, we, we love doing the, the physical work. And I think we kind of let the paperwork and the accounting kind of slide a little bit. And I'm... Um, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, could we have just, we probably could have made $5,000 more if we had just, you know, moved a couple numbers around on the spreadsheet and did some tax deductions. We probably missed a few things. And so that's what I, I don't want to miss any of that stuff. So I want to get better at that. Yeah, for sure. Yep. There's a lot of deductions with flipping and real estate. And how do, do you guys have it set up as an entity now? Or uh, Yeah. Well, we are set up as an LLC or equal partners. Okay. I would talk to your accountant too about if that's have you talked to them if that's the best way to do it or if... uh yes he has told okay. me that's the best way to do it yes okay because mine is set up as an s corp right now that's how mine told me to do it i always leave that to the accountants too whatever they say i go with but <laughs> yeah as long as you're talking to your accountant and, and he says that's a good way to go i would go that route so all right very all right. cool yeah. nice well one other thing i just thought of i was going to mention before is if you do end up being you know getting well you're going to get your license if you end up listing the houses, saving money. One thing you might consider with the partnership is paying each other separate for the services you do. That's just one thought. You know, if he's still doing work as a contractor and you stop doing work as a contractor, you know, there might be some hard feelings if you're still getting 50-50, but he feels like he's doing more work. Or if you're, you know, using your license to get lots of good deals and saving all this money on commissions, but then he's not doing any contracting work. He's not doing any work on the, you know, as many hours. Maybe there's hard feelings on your side. Like, oh, I'm finding all these deals. I'm saving us all this money in commissions, but you're not really doing anything. So one thought would be, you know, maybe think about it. You know, if you have any concerns about, hey, you get paid a commission on everything you do. He gets paid for any contracting work on anything he does. Sometimes that makes the partnerships run smoother in the future. Yes, I've heard horror stories with working with family and it can get ugly. So far, we've been great and we we've been splitting everything and we'll have to consider that in the future for sure yeah and i think if you're both working at it all the time you're both kind of splitting the money equally then that works fine but if you start doing different stuff or one of you decides he wants to pursue some other kind of career part-time i think that's when you see the problems and one person feels like well i'm working all this time and he's not doing anything why am i getting you know the same amount of money so but yeah it's something to think about and maybe in the future pursue a different way to handle things if, if you see that coming. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, I think we covered quite a bit. Anything else? Any questions? Anything else going on you want to talk about? No, I don't. That's that's pretty much everything, I think. You, you got to it all. Cool. Well, yeah, this is kind of the first one. You know, I had a, a podcast last week with Dennis Bassetto, who's in one of my coaching programs, but he's been doing real well. And this was kind of cool doing it this way as kind of a, a coaching podcast type of thing. So <laughs> I hope it helped. And I hope maybe you learned some and some other people learned from it. And yeah, it sounds like you're on the right track and doing great for, for how quickly you got into it. Thank you. We're, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can right now. And I do sometimes get down on myself and think we're not doing enough. So that's one of my faults. But then if I, when I step back and look at it and talk to you about it, I'm like, okay, it's, that's not so bad, actually. Yeah, no, I think you're doing great. I mean, it can take some time to get going in the business and, and doing that many deals in the first couple of years. Of course, we'd all like to do better <laughs> and, and do more. But at the same time, you kind of have to look at what you're doing and say, okay, I'm doing pretty good. I can improve on things, obviously, but I'm doing pretty good right now. I do have one question for you. How many hours a day are you actually working? I know you... You have a ton of different avenues going at, at once. Like, What's your weekly hours like? It's hard to say because sometimes, you know, blog stuff and writing 
meshes into sort of not work or is it work, but <laughs> on average, like I'll come into the office usually about eight to eight thirty, I'll leave my house. And I'll usually be home by five at the latest. And I live like five minutes away, so that's an easy drive. Twice a week, I usually play golf during the day. So like Tuesdays, I'll play nine holes and Thursdays, I'll play 18 holes. And then on the weekends, I usually don't work at all. I never do anything on the weekends. Once in a while, I might, you know, I'll be answering emails or maybe writing an article in the evening. But for the most part, I probably work about 35 hours at the most, most weeks. Impressive. Yeah. So like, you know, that gives me something to shoot for. Hopefully model myself after like how you do it. And I see you're not really killing yourself working 80 hours a week. So if I could, no. do, half, if I could do half of what you're doing, I think I'd, I'd be <laughs> more than happy. Yeah. Once you start hiring the right people and getting the right people on your team and then things really start to go well. It makes life so much easier. Cause yeah, I used to work 80 hours a week when I had, at one point I had 80 HUD listings as an agent and I was pretty much doing all that myself and it was driving me crazy. So once I started hiring, I hired an assistant and hired some help, it made my life so much easier. And then I just kept building on that and teaching them more and delegating more. And yeah, once you can get to that point of trusting other people, it makes things a lot easier. Oh, uh, I did. Sorry, I have one more question for you about when you talked about being a, a HUD listing agent. And since I'm getting my realtor's license soon, should I try to specialize and find a niche like like that, or what, what's your suggestion for I think going, going into it? When you're first starting out, I would do what you said: friends, family, sphere of influence. Really work that to start with. But then, you know, I would think about a niche as well. It's going to be really hard to get into REO and HUD listings as a new agent. Uh, most banks want to see at least two years of experience, but you can start doing BPOs, which are broker price opinions right away for some companies, yeah, which I, is, a, I read about that. Yeah. It was like $50 yeah, so, a, a shot for those. Yep. So that's one way to get started. But yeah, I mean, I would really focus on your sphere of influence, meeting clients, you know, kind of building a database that you can market to. But then, yeah, I mean, look out for different niches, different ways that you, different parts of the real estate you like as well, you know, try a few different things and see what you really enjoy doing. And then I would focus on those. So you're going to be more successful if you like doing it, no matter what you're doing. Yeah. That's kind of what I had in mind. I'll just start out with doing the general stuff and then see where it takes me. Yep. And it helps too, if whatever broker you're working with, you know, has the time to really help you and mentor you and, and teach you. That really helps as well. It will help you get started quick. Good. Good. Yeah. He's uh, independent and he just, he has no one else working for him and he's been doing it for 30 years or so. So he's, Definitely know, knows his stuff. Cool. Great. Great. All right. Well, I think we covered just about everything we could. <laughs> I hope, hope this is, you can edit this out and, and make it sound good and someone will listen to it. Oh, yeah. Nope. I'm sure a lot of people will get a lot of out of it. So, no, Brett, thank you so much for being on the show, and I appreciate you reaching out to me. Like I said before, you know, Brett just sent me an email. He reviewed one of my books, gave me a short bio, and we got him on the show. And so thank you for doing that. Uh, it was fun for me to hear your story and hear what you're doing and how you've built your business. Thank you for being on the show, and I'm sure we'll, we'll hopefully we'll keep in touch as well. Okay, awesome. I, I will update you when things happen. All right, sounds good. Maybe we'll have you on the show again in a few months or who knows, down the road and see how your business has, has improved. Okay, I'd be up for that. All right, thank you so much, Brett, and yeah, have a great day. You too, thank you. All right, bye. Bye. 